Thank you. Okay, can you hear me in the back? All right. It's funny, when I gave this talk at the conference, there was a room larger than this and it wasn't mic'd, but I'm glad it's mic'd because uh, all the smoke in the air has done a little something to my voice. <clears throat> um, so uh, where this talk came from is um, I uh, am a trainer, Java trainer. Uh, I also write, have my way, way back 20 plus, Years ago, when I had in my own software company, I wrote the manual in the days when you actually got a CD or floppy disks um, and an actual printed manual. I created a 300 page manual for that. So I have a long history of, of doing both documentation and software development and Java training. Um, and so this came out of, even though it's not specific to any one kind of uh, material, um, I think there's a lot of core concepts here that, that I think you'll find useful. Um, so uh, ask questions when you have them, but I may say I'm going to touch on that since I'll hold it. And uh, if I don't get to it, make sure you ask it, ask it at the end. Um, human learning. So uh, the reason I have this here is I, I saw this on Twitter is basically words in buns and somebody created just a little program to you type some words and it puts it in a bun and I just thought it was hilarious um, so I was like I'll squeeze it in even though there's that's it so um, so human learning uh, when I originally thought about this talk it's like I'm just gonna have a talk about learning most people at least certainly in this area when you say learning they think of and even the term deep learning, which means something else, it's like, oh, machine learning. It's like, no, no, human learning, how we learn, um, and uh, you know, I won't, I won't comment on the fact that I think machine learning is just fancy statistics, but uh, there's a lot of <clears throat> things that are uniquely human about how we learn, how we take in information, and what we do with it, and what are some ways to optimize for the strange, odd things that our brain does. And so uh, this is me in, in, a, in a Java training class, uh, and you can see the picture was well-timed. I had my back to the class. Usually it's not that, that way, because actually they're all supposed to be busy working on a lab. Um, so as I said, I've, I've you know, done software. I've done uh, manuals and documentation and training, and I've done training on and off for the past 20 years, and I've worked um, most recently for Apple, and when I left and I wanted to get back into training, I thought there's got to be new stuff that people have figured out how to teach and how to teach um, technical topics you know, in the 15 years since the last time I really did any training. When I did training development at Apple, um, there were some interesting things that came up, such as mistakes that I had made in the lab exercises turned out to be the most valuable learning that people had. And I was like, wow, how do I make more mistakes like that? Um, how, do I get, how do I get people to be like, wow, I didn't realize that, um, and help them you know, work through those, those problems. And so I started doing research. Um, I've always been a researcher. Uh, my biggest um, period of happiness was when I was at NYU and I had access, in the pre-web days, I had access to all the technical computing journals, right? stacks and stacks of physical journals that I could pull off the shelf and read. Um, that was just nirvana for me. Nowadays, it's almost overwhelming with the amount of stuff you can get on the web. So I started doing some, some research because I was tired of um, wasted potential. Sitting, having folks sit in a class, knowing that I was doing the, the best that I thought I could and getting them to understand the material and realizing I was falling short. And even though I would get super high ratings, people would call me back, they felt like I, there had to be something, something more. So I happened to come across um, this book called How Learning Works. And I feel kind of lucky that I came across this book because it was a really nice introduction to some of the research-based uh, concepts about education. And that's something that um, I really feel is important is, is there's a lot of, oh, this feels right. Oh, I feel like I know this. Oh, I think this is the right way, but not enough evidence-based. And for this kind of thing, for learning, it's actually uh, really hard to figure out what works. It's very much a social science kind of thing. It's, it's, in fact, it's part of uh, what's called educational psychology. 
And so it's really hard to do experiments to figure this out. How do we do, um, how do we teach people language? How do we teach people math? How do we teach people science? And a lot of it's oriented at, you know, school age kids, because those are the ones who do, you know, a lot of learning. Um, but a lot of it does apply because they, you know, they have brains just differently developing brains than, than we as adults have. And so I came across this book and, and it was academic enough uh, and really focused on uh, the research oriented. So I felt like, oh, that was a good start. So then I came across this book, which despite the weird title, I, I always look back at this and it's like, the title is Why Don't Students Like School? I don't know that I ever felt like this, the book answered that, and maybe because I already had a little bit too much knowledge, but um, it's really, it's written by a cognitive uh, scientist, and so he talks about the cognitive and you know, how the brain works and how learning happens. Um, and I was like, wow, this is really good. Uh, started getting deeper into the science. And so, of course, then I started looking at uh, research papers. So <clears throat> I'll talk more about cognitive load theory specifically, but this is sort of the, the paper that came out and, and, and really started looking at how do we figure out how not to overload the brains as we're learning. Um, and for those of you taking pictures, uh, I will have these slides posted, so you, but feel free to take them anyway, just so you don't have to worry about that. Then um, uh, Richard Meyer uh, has this whole idea of multimedia learning. And for me, the word, I don't know about you, but for me, the word multimedia is always, feels old fashioned somehow. I don't know, it just feel, doesn't feel high tech enough. It feels like, oh, that was videotaping, you know, in, in the 80s. Um, but it, it's all the same concept. So multimedia learning simply means multimedia, video, pictures, that kind of thing. Um, then the uh, third, third paper is, um, talks about tests and forgetting. Um, and forgetting is something that we do all the time, thank God, because uh, if we didn't forget everything, we wouldn't be, be paralyzed. We wouldn't know what to do because we would just be overwhelmed with information. So I read those papers and more papers. Um, then it's like, all right, I splurged for the $150 book because it's, it's Springer, and if you know anything about Springer, sometimes their books are expensive. Um, this is the book on cognitive load theory. And then, well, I got, went a little overboard. <laughs> um, I can tell you it's been scientifically proven that having a stack of books does not mean you understand what's in them. Just food for thought. Um, I have to admit I've not read all these, but I've read a, a lot of these. And so I've read a lot of books and I've read a lot of papers and I was like, wow, this is really good stuff that I can incorporate into my training. Um, but we're sometimes overwhelmed by information. And I think that's sort of, if you think about the one thing that, that we have to be careful of is overwhelm. Learning is, is hard, especially, I mean, learning, even if you're learning just the smallest thing and it's tightly focused, and I'll talk about how, to, how, you, how you can do that, it's still hard. And when there's other stuff that's, that's sort of either not important or you don't have the knowledge, then it can be overwhelming and you can almost shut down. Okay, so that's sort of the preamble. Let's look at um, the, the, basically the, the rest of this presentation. I'll start off with a quick definition of what learning is. We'll look a little bit about how memory and the brain uh, learn and encode information. And then we'll look at some of the theory underlying it and some of the evidence that supports it, as well as some of the things people think are scientific and actually aren't. And then we'll look at examples. So, this is the definition of learning I'm going to work on, work with. The funny thing about trying to define learning is it's hard. Even this definition is like, well, okay, so, you know, but this, but, you know, I think we have a good concept of what it is. Usually, we know somebody's learned something because they've demonstrated it, right? Really, we don't know what's inside other people's heads. The only way for me to know if you've learned anything from what I've said is for me to ask you about it and then see if you, you actually got that. I'll do that. So I want to start with long-term memory. Long-term memory is kind of amazing. It is um, actually 
seemingly limitless in terms of what it can hold. And all the knowledge that we have, um, and there's different kinds of knowledge, which I'll talk about, um, all that is held in long-term memory. And so it's you know, relatively easy to put stuff into long-term memory. The problem we often have is getting stuff out of long-term memory, the retrieval part. And so there's a lot of stuff that's been studies and, and uh, work that's been done on how do we get stuff out. And the more that we get stuff out, the easier it is to get that stuff out. And that's what's called retrieval practice. Um, but let's first look at, at how it gets in there. So this is a model. Um, and like all models, it's useful, but not precisely correct. But it's useful enough that um, it explains some of the experiments that people have done. Um, <clears throat> at the top is the central executive. And you can kind of think of, you know, it's the thing that's guiding your attention. And you know, you're listening to my words. And you're looking at that. And that's controlling the focus of, of, of what you're paying attention to. It's literally your attention. And so that's why I kind of crossed out memory. It's, instead of working memory, I'm calling it working attention. It's a, it's a very active process. And so then there, there's, there are basically two places or three places we can store information for short term, for a very small amount of time, is in these different areas. So there's the visual spatial sketch pad. So when you look at something, right, if you're looking at this image and you sort of close your eyes, you can bring back that image in your head. That's the visual spatial sketch pad, sorry, um, working. If you're trying to memorize a license plate because they almost hit you on the streets of San Francisco and you're repeating it to yourself, you're going seven, eight, that's this phonological loop. And what's nice about that is you can use it, uh, well, that's weird, some of it got cut off. Basically, you, even though it's only stored for a couple of seconds, you can keep repeating it and you're sort of refreshing it, like you know, sort of refreshing your, your RAM. Um, the visual spatial sketch pad also is very, very short term. It fades pretty quickly. And if you don't have some way of putting it into long-term storage, it will just be gone. And so the idea is with these short-term things, we want to be able to encode them and put them in our long-term memory so we can retrieve them later. So in order to do that, in order to put stuff into long-term memory, it's not like it's just this big thing that we can just throw stuff into. Everything we put into long-term memory has to be connected to something that's already there. And these connections you know, might look something like this. You start out with something where you, know, you sort of have pre-existing stuff, and then you add some new piece of information. You've encoded it and, and, and taken it in and now connected it to other things. And the more you do that, the more you take in this and connect it and say, oh, that's related to this other thing, you make these connections stronger. And there's been a lot of you know, biological science where you're literally making these connections stronger. And so you can keep doing that until you now have, and you've not only connected them, but you've reinforced these pathways by constant use, by saying, oh, this is related to this other thing, and I remember this thing. And then you're faced with a problem where you might need it, and you re-retrieve that information and that whole network of information. And the more you retrieve it, the more you practice it, um, the stronger the connections become. So a concrete example, when you're learning a new concept, so you might have information, you know, if you're in grade school, you might have information about math and addition and, you know, you know, multiple times of adding something up and realizing, oh, multiplication, that's connected with addition, it's repeated addition, it's iterative addition, and you use it more and more and it becomes stronger and it's very much related to then addition and all the other things that addition was related to. And so you can start connecting these. So you can see that this concept slots right in to, to other things that are connected to. The problem is, is that if you don't have that prior knowledge, right? if you had never done addition before, multiplication would, would be very, very difficult to learn, especially if you're trying to convey multiplication as repeated addition and somebody is not aware or really good at knowing what addition is, that's going to be really hard. And so at the top, if we already have this good foundation, what's called prior knowledge, and not being aware of prior knowledge when you're instructing is, um, makes things hard on everybody. If you're trying to convey concepts and you've never heard of, of the concepts before that, that you're supposed to be building on, you'll, you'll be at the, at the bottom here and stuff will fall down and fall over. And you might even learn something wrong because you connected it slightly to concepts 
that you weren't sure about. And so prior knowledge and figuring out what that prior knowledge is, is, is critical. Um, and I'll show so, some examples of that. But um, I was working with a client and we were looking at what exactly do I need, you know, what level of students are they? Uh, it was a Java class and I needed to know, you know, is this like super intro? They sort of know the syntax and maybe they've written a few programs or like they're really fluent in that and they want to learn the, the, the deeper concepts. And so what I got back was a survey that was, well, I've had one year of experience with this, six months experience with this, three months experience with this. And I'm like, that's not helpful, right? We, we all know that like, just because you've been exposed to something for a period of time does not mean you actually know it. And so probing for very specific things, this is why we have um, tests and quizzes to, to examine what do you know and figure out what knowledge you actually have at your disposal, what you can retrieve. And once you understand that, then you can start saying, oh, okay, so they're pretty weak over here because I've tested them and probed this area, and now I can address that and then build, build that up. Here they have that knowledge, so there's no point in boring them um, because they already, already have that knowledge. So Cursed by Expertise is also, um, if we, we often think we're teaching to the top, they already have this knowledge and they don't, um, we're like, how could you not know that? And if, you know, if you're experienced, you know that it's like, it's not, it, we often as experts don't know what we know. And I'll show some ways to, to get around that. So, but as I mentioned, retrieval is the hardest part, right? It's very easy to get stuff into memory, but how do I retrieve it? How do I make it accessible so that when I need it, when I see a problem, how do I know how to, how to get it back? So as I mentioned, long-term memory is, is huge. And there's this idea of disuse. So it's hard to recall things after you don't access them for a while. So I'm sure you've all had this experience, um, or if, if you've, uh, where you haven't worked with something for a while, maybe you haven't ridden a bike in a while, but you did know how to do it at some point. You get back on it, you might be a little wobbly, but after a while, you're back to, to the performance you had before. Or in my case, my son is in school, and so he's doing math, and I'm like, how do we do these equations again? But once I sort of relearn it, then I'm able to, to, to do it and to teach him because I had that good foundation. It's just hasn't been used in a while, hadn't been accessed in a while. The last time I solved for a quadratic equation was who, know, who knows how long ago. And so being able to retrieve that and connect it back reestablishes those pathways. Um, but they went away for, for a while, but the network of knowledge was, was still there. So one of the things I started incorporating in my classes, because I wanted to, to have them retrieve it, especially as you're learning it, it's very easy to make weak connections, and I wanted to strengthen them. So what I did was use a form of retrieval practice uh, called a learning journal. So at the beginning of my classes, I would, every student would get a journal, and at first, when I started using this, I just have them, I just tell them, hey, write down things you remember, write down things you're still confused about, write down things you have questions about. Um, but I didn't give them a lot of guidance. And so I found a wide range of, some students were able to use their journal very effectively and some not so much. Um, so I did some more research and dove into reflective practice and, and learning prompts and all these kinds of things and came up with a more prompted uh, set of questions that people, because what I didn't realize is they were novices at using a learning journal. Because I've used it before and we've all, you know, to varying degrees taken notes, but these, these were novices. And so I had to give them con more concrete steps and more concrete examples to help guide them on what to write in their learning journal. And so this, um, this is the, actually the current way I do it now um, I actually have several different slides depending on where it is. If it's right after a lab, I have lab-oriented uh, questions um, and prompts. If it's sort of a general thing at the end of the day, I make sure that, that, they, that they write things down. So this was effective because it, it forced them to retrieve the information that they have been absorbing during the day. So the other way, um, and this is actually pretty common in, in, in schools but can be used anywhere, especially if you're learning on your own, is the testing effect. And so the, the, right, the actual act of being tested helps students learn better. 
And in fact, turns out, they, um, in, in one of the studies, students scored a full grade higher uh, on tested material when they had these quizzes, the, what do they call low stakes, no grade associated with it, quizzes to help them re, you know, practice that retrieval. And so the more, the more they did that, the, the better their grades got. And that's just the generic concept of the more you try to retrieve things, the, uh, the better you've established that pathway and so they're easily retrievable. Um, so there's a great website, retrievalpractice.org, talks about this and other techniques for retrieval practice. So related to this is this idea of desirable difficulties. What we want is we want that, that attempt to retrieve to be hard. Because if it's easy, then they're not improving. And so that's why there's you know, sort of this you know, metaphor of your brain as a muscle. You know, if, if I can lift you know, 10 pounds easily, if I keep doing that, I'm not really building up any more muscle. I've, I've, I've maxed out. So what, what do you do? Well, you either repeat it more often or you go to heavier weights. So you go to heavier weights. And so what would be the equivalent in trying to retrieve information is allowing yourself to forget a little bit. So there's a forgetting curve where over time you forget unless you try and sort of reinvigorate that memory and try and retrieve it. The longer you let it go and then try to retrieve it, the harder it is. But if you were able to retrieve it, now that connection is much stronger. And in fact, there's software, you might have heard of it, Anki, A-N-K-I is one of them, that will space out, the, uh, use flashcards with you know, questions and answers, and it will space them out based on how well you did. So the better you do, the longer it spaces it out so that it says, I'm gonna wait until you've forgotten it a bit more, and then I'll, then I'll grab you. And then you, over time, learn a little more material. So waiting before recalling what's called spaced retrieval is a way of using the fact that that makes things harder to make your learning and remembering better. Another way is instead of cramming what's called mass practice, right? I know I did this in school. Like you, you, you look at a topic and you study it, study, 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 just that one topic. Um, and you may have recalled it maybe the next morning and then that afternoon it's mostly gone. So the idea of mixing it up in what's called interleaving. So instead of doing a lot of studying on this topic A and then moving on to this topic B, you interleave them. Um, and in the, the kind of stuff I do, uh, I will teach a concept and then move on to another one and then a third one and then come back and, and now a little bit more com complex use of that first part. And so there's this idea of sort of spiraling upward. You're coming back to it, but at a higher level. Um, and that's where my company name came from, Spiral Learning, is this idea of you start with a concept, you move on to another one, you come back to it at a higher level, incorporating it. And as you move back and forth, you are, every time you hit that topic you studied before, you're re-retrieving it and now also incorporating it and connecting it to other concepts. The other thing that you can do to, to make recall hard, right, a desirable difficulty, is you change your environment. Instead of always studying on your comfortable couch, you might study uh, on the floor, you might study outside, you might study in the classroom. Um, you might have different associations with things, so you may have uh, always associated this with a certain way of, of, of doing math. Maybe you also then associate it with cooking and how can I multiply things to get from cooking for more people, and you use it in different contexts. And the more variety you have, the more we start pattern matching against what's common across these and what's different. And that helps us really understand uh, the underlying concept. So one place that it was actually thought that this idea of disfluency might be useful is making it harder to read. So how many of you have read Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, anyone? So there's this idea of a system one and a system two. The system one is sort of this automatic response. Um, I could ask you a, a, a standard problem and you would you know, give me the answer you thought it was right away. System two takes a little bit longer, it's a little bit more work, 
And one thing we know about the brain is it wants to conserve energy. It loves being lazy because it wants to conserve energy. So it's always going to jump to an answer for the question it thought you asked, rather than work hard to figure out what you actually asked and solve that. So there was this um, experiment in 2011 uh, where they had people read um, something that they would then take a little test about comprehension and use a font that was harder to read. Um, I love the title of the paper. The title of the paper is called Fortune Favors the Bold, and in parentheses, and the Italicized. Um, so they basically were saying, let's, let's see if that causes us to switch from this automatic mode of just pulling in information and almost maybe not even being aware of it to, to, to sort of force us into this, let's look at system two that really says, all right, let's really get in there and dig in there and, and, and take our time and, and really go deep. Turned out it didn't work. Um, even though that study proved there was some benefit, there was a whole bunch of follow-on studies, replication studies and expanding on it that showed, yeah, well, we thought it might work and it might work in these very, very specific situations, but it's not something we can generalize and use everywhere. So do not print your documents in fonts like this. That will not help. So uh, you might have heard the phrase, you know, we can hold sort of seven plus or minus two. That's, that's a, you know, done by Miller back in the 50s, a study where we kind of, he kind of found that, you know, your memory could hold seven plus or minus two items um, in your, in your short-term memory that you could work with. Uh, it turns out that that paper, you know, like a lot of things, has been sort of handed down and we sort of take that as gospel. It's like, okay, so I can, you know, we can handle seven things. It turns out, no, we can't. Um, the size of our working memory is actually more like four. Four is really the limit of how many, what I'll call chunks or units of things that we can manipulate while we're trying to do a task. What Miller found actually is that once you go above seven to nine, um, you're actually, that's when errors are happening. And what you want is you want to keep it in a place where errors are not happening. Because if errors are happening, then you're dropping stuff on the floor. You're no longer juggling these items in your head and you've lost information or you're, you've stopped learning. So really, uh, Cowan and some other folks who have, who have studied this, we found that it's really working memory is about three or four. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the things that you cannot do, at least there have been no scientific evidence for, is you cannot increase that number. This idea of brain training or uh, cognitive training, um, honestly, maybe it works, but right now there's no scientific evidence and there's been a lot of research to show that you can increase that. Yeah. So how does that apply to diagrams? So many of us work for companies that make complicated things. We want to have pictures. And does that mean we should only have four things on a picture? Or is seven okay? Or, you know, any ideas on that? Absolutely. So great question. Basically, when we're displaying information to someone, should we limit it to, to just a few items? So one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say again is it's chunks. It is not what are called elements. So if you look at a, a complex diagram, so uh, let's actually look at, let's say this diagram. You've never seen it before. There's a bunch of different elements. We've got three yellow boxes. We've got two pink arrows. We've got five blue arrows. And then we've got a bunch of text. There's probably, what, 15 different elements here. But I'm an expert maybe. I'm um, expert enough. I can look at this and there's maybe three or four chunks. Because I have chunked this, I've also seen this diagram a lot. Um, so I'm able to, to, that juggling of all these different things is not individual elements, it's what have I been able to chunk and associate together. Um, the common example in this is, is chess and the chessboard. Someone who's very familiar with chess can look at a chess board that's legal um, and remember it. No problem. Whereas a novice, they're going to be memorizing each individual piece. Whereas an expert, they can look at the whole thing and they know where all the pieces are and hold it in their memory. Because they are experts, they've looked at it enough, they've played it enough, they are able to chunk it into one chunk that they can then only use up one slot. 
A novice, though, is going to use up a whole bunch of slots because they're going to be tracking each individual piece, which is one reason they don't play as well. They're, they're, they're having trouble just figuring out what is my next legal move, let alone what are moves, multiple, multiple moves ahead. I'll also come back to some other examples of that. So this idea of limited working memory is, as I mentioned, with the cognitive load theory, and I'll <clears throat> talk about that now, is um, how do we make sure we're not overwhelming them? And so this is where novice to expert comes in. So we need to know what is their prior knowledge? What is their chunking ability? Because mental effort, this idea of juggling these things, it's an active process, right? If I'm juggling you know, three balls because I just learned how, then I'm probably doing okay. Um, once I start being, getting fancy and I'm really good at that, I might you know, use bowling balls because they're heavier and that's harder, but then I get used to that. Um, but you wouldn't want to start somebody off with that. That'd be kind of ridiculous unless you want to get a lawsuit. And so this is where the cognitive load theory comes from. It's like, what can we do when we're instructing or providing information? What can we do to limit that mental effort? To stay in that three to four uh, capacity, right? So because we want to have them be able to look at something and keep track of it and work with it, but also have some room for, for, for absorbing that and then putting it into long-term memory and connecting with other things. If we completely overwhelm them, then they may be just struggling to try and absorb what you've shown them. So this is just a different way of looking at um, and focusing on uh, memory in a different way. So here we've got, uh, coming in from the left, we've got our stimuli, right? That's you know, both stuff visually, uh, audio, um, what we sense and feel. Um, and that capacity uh, will vary. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about the capacity of sensory memory. Um, this working memory ca capacity, it's, even though it says seven to nine chunks, uh, it, like I said, it's actually more like four. Um, there are ways to sort of keep stuff in there and keep it refreshed by, by repeating it. But the important part here is once we've got working memory going appropriately and we haven't overloaded it, we can put stuff into long-term memory, pull stuff from long-term memory, associate it, and then push stuff back into long-term memory. This idea of encoding, retrieving, and re-encoding that information. And what's stored in long-term memory is, is, I won't go too deep into it, but it's basically mental models. Right? So when we think of you know, now maybe when you think of working memory, you'll have a somewhat, maybe a bit fuzzy, but a mental model of, oh, okay, there are different pieces and they have different, different capacities. And if you learn more about it, then you would start connecting that with your existing knowledge. Unless you found out that I was wrong and lying about something or just had something wrong and now, you, now you've got trying to connect knowledge to incorrect knowledge and that's a problem. But hopefully that won't be the case. So this is what cognitive load is. Um, a little bit. Uh, so um, the green is sort of nouns and the yellows are more verb-like, but it's more to a little bit of, of, of both difficulty and also trying to associate colors with, with some things. Is that distracting from actually reading it as a whole? Fair, fair enough. But maybe I'm more distractible than <laughs> the audience. <laughs> um, I think that's on. Yeah, so, the, so I want to distract you a little bit because otherwise you might gloss over it too easily and, and, and not think about it. So if I, I've actually succeeded, if you have caused you to th think more about it. Are you saying that's a desirable difficulty? Uh, this might be a desirable difficulty. If it actually caused difficulty but not too much so that it frustrated Monique, that it actually caused her to think deeply about it, then I've succeeded. If not, then I have failed. So. And again, a, entire books and papers have been written about this. So this is more just a little bit so that you know what terms to Google for later. Um, I'm not going to dive deep into this because, again, I could give multiple talks just on this. But there's this idea when we're creating instructional materials, right? A textbook, a web page of some sort, even a video. There's the concept that you're trying to learn. And that's what's called the germane load, the stuff you're actively thinking about, right? So if I'm, I'm thinking about 
programming. I'm trying to think, okay, I want to put objects and connect them together, and I write classes, and, and I run this stuff, and that's what, that's what I'm trying to learn. The intrinsic load are the steps that are being supplied to me, right? the instructions that are being supplied to lead me through some process that will lead me to working through an example and, and learning something. Extraneous load is stuff that might be in there that isn't important for the concept that's being learned and can be either distracting or irrelevant. And this is where, uh, to, to this question before, what's extraneous depends on your level of expertise. I can look at like a class diagram, a UML diagram, and not be distracted by all the stuff that you can find in these complex diagrams, because I've worked with them for 25 years. You show them to a novice and they're like, oh my god, even just like the most simple diagram is overwhelming because they haven't seen it before, they haven't been able to chunk the information, they don't know what is important versus what is not important. And so this is something that when you're creating materials, especially for novices, it's amazing how easily they can be overwhelmed. You could put you know, just a few steps and they're like, I'm totally lost. And that inc increases all sorts of things besides the cognitive load, increases anxiety and, 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 and all sorts of other things. Um, and so figuring out again, what is the level of person you're, what is your audience? Who are, who are you talking to? What is their prior knowledge? What is their level of, of expertise? So the idea is we want to um, allow as much of that mental effort to be going towards understanding and solving the problem and help them along the way with good instructional materials sequenced so that they start with something very simple and move on step by step to more and more complex uh, scenarios. And as much as possible to get rid of, of extraneous things. Okay, so let's take a, yeah. Sorry. Yep. Um, <clears throat> um, the, uh, sorry if I was, if I might have missed something, but the definition of terms up here, I mean, intrinsic versus extraneous versus germane. Um, did you cover these earlier? Should I, should we just kind of know like, what all the just, just keep in mind that, that germane load is, is the load that when you're solving a problem and you kind of feel that mental effort, your brain working, that's the germane load. That's the, that's, that's the work that you want your brain to do. When you're giving instructions to someone, especially if you're teaching them something, you want them to be focusing most of that effort in their brain of working on what is associated with the, with the topic or the problem itself. The, remember, this is the point of, from the point of view of creating instructional materials. So then intrinsic load is, well, do step A, then do step B, then you'll see step C, and then do step D, and then followed by step E, and you'll see result F. Those steps, that instructional sequence of things that you're having the learner do, that's the intrinsic load. They can't do the problem unless you give them the things that they, the steps that they need to do. Anything that gets in the way that's like, hey, while you're here, also do this other thing, um, is extraneous and can overload their, their memory. Yeah, kind of like instructional blurbs of information in the middle of a student guide where there's, there's task, you know, it's a, a task-based table, it's a table of tasks in an exercise, and then they stop and they tell you, some extra stuff to find this stuff go here. Right. But it's really got nothing to do with your flow and right. what you're trying to do. Your yes. Okay. That's a, yeah. And I see, this a, I see this a lot. Um, I have a couple of examples, but I see this a lot where I know we feel when we're teaching something, it's like, oh, there's this really cool thing I, wanna, I want them to know about. Don't put it here. Let, put it somewhere else. If they're doing these steps and they're a novice, you don't want to, and I'll show an example of where I just a few weeks ago made this exact mistake of confusing them because they're very easily confused with stuff that an expert is like, oh, that's kind of cool. But a novice, they're sort of easily distracted because they're unable to discern what's important and what's not. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's, there's, there's tough concepts there. Um, and I know that that's something I want more examples of next time I do this talk. Um, so I want to touch on the feedback cycle, because I think this is something that's overlooked uh, in learning, is that 
So experience is you do something and you get feedback, right? If you're riding a bicycle, I love this example because my son took forever to ride, the bicycle, ride his bicycle um, because he had, had some difficulty with the feedback. Um, if you have any balance issues or there, you have sensory issues um, or attention issues, it can be much harder to learn how to, how to ride a bicycle. Um, uh, and so getting that feedback and then incorporating it fast enough, especially if you're riding a bike or, God forbid, driving a car. My son will never drive a car. Um, <laughs> right, that feedback has to be taken into account and you have to adjust. Like if you're you know, driving and all of a sudden, you know, maybe the road tilts and you realize you have to counteract that. Or I remember driving over uh, the San Mateo Hayward Bridge and really, really windy, like you're fighting that wind and so you have to adapt for that. Uh, if you just kind of were like, oh, I'll wait, and then you're drifting off into you know, other cars, probably not good. So feedback is really important in order to correct what you're doing. And I feel like um, sports, phys ed, like, they understand this. For high-performance sports, they really understand the idea of feedback and, and giving it and providing it quickly. And I feel like there's a lot of learning that's one way. And without that feedback, you don't know if you're, you're learning correctly. Language, learning a foreign language is, is the best example. Um, how do you know if you're pronouncing it right? How do you know if you're able to express your ideas correctly? Um, without feedback, you really have no idea. So the idea is in the cycle, you do something, you have some way of observing the outcome, you get feedback, you match what the outcome was with what you wanted it to be, and maybe, and then think about, okay, what was the difference? How do I adjust? And you try it again, and you continue to go through this loop. And if it's not timely, then you have no way to reflect what you did versus what you were supposed to do. And I see this a lot in coding, where the magic of software is we're able to write stuff and get it to work without maybe fully understanding why or it sort of, we've hacked stuff together and it works, and the feedback we got is because it compiled and we think it works, but it's really not working well. Um, and then the quality of the code may be kind of not great. Um, and so when I look at code and when I work with students, I look at the code and say, yes, this works, but let's talk about how it's structured, how you name things, how you partition things, because that is, you, you won't get, you may not ever get any feedback from the system on that level. And so providing that kind of feedback is, is really important. So something that you want to do, in, in, uh, when, especially when you're teaching novices, is I, I feel like 90 plus percent of the documentation I see is, is like somehow they're, they were charging their, their clients per example. There are so few of them. You can never have too many examples. Right? If you're ever writing documentation, like, yeah, I'll put in one or two examples. No, put in like six or seven. But make sure the first one, and I'll, use, I'll show an example, make sure the first one is super simple. Because we learn from concrete stuff. Thank you. <laughs> we work from concrete stuff, and from concrete stuff, from having multiple examples to choose from and look at and compare and contrast and build upon it, then we are able to, to abstract, to get to the level of the abstraction. But if you have one example, and how many people have put foo and bar in their example? <laughs> I won't shame you, but no, don't do that. That's like meaningless. That's really not helpful. Um, I know as creating documentation and examples and, and so on, it's really hard to come up with the good examples, but I think we get paid enough to come up with some good examples, maybe. So one of the things about worked examples, the idea of a worked example, is here's the end goal, and here's all the things that it took to get there, like free of charge, here you go. Now, then you can start, um, especially in an instructional environment, you can start saying, okay, I've given you not only the, the problem and the solution and how that solution worked, now I'm gonna fade it back and, and, and take some of it back. So it does what's called scaffolding learning, right? And like scaffolds for most buildings, I know some buildings it seems like the scaffold's there forever, but eventually they go away. Um, and this idea of you first need to scaffold them, give them everything they need to know, and let them work on that one little tiny piece. 
All right, so in Java, my typical thing is, here's an entire project, here's a class, here's the, the main, everything is there for you, this one line, write your code just right here. Don't write anything else, don't even look at everything else, just write that one line right here and run it. Then you can start looking and expanding your, but it's like, just don't look at this other stuff, just focus on this one piece. And as I said, we learn from examples. Um, we are, con you know, we start concrete, and examples are sort of the ultimate in concreteness of, of the things that we need to do. I mean, otherwise Stack Overflow wouldn't be so popular, right? Copy and paste, like, you know. So you just have to be careful when you create them that you're not overloading, and I'll show some examples, you're not overloading uh, their cognitive ability. So here's a worked example. Um, if you know anything about Java, you know that these two things are Java beans. If you don't, trust me, they are Java beans. And so this is in, in a class that I teach um, where one of the things they have to do in this lab is create a Java bean. So they have to create a class that is almost exactly like that first example. So I'm saying, here's an example. Here's a full example, totally works. All you need to do is, at, at the very least, do a search and replace of the word description with the word product, and you're done. And so that's for, for strings, for text. Um, the bottom example is for integers, for numbers. And so if you looked at them and you didn't know what the hell they were, you could look and compare and contrast. Oh, okay, I see that the int is in used in place of the string, so okay, I get that. I see the commonalities and I see the differences. The mistake I had made was introduced, so it turned out for this lab, they actually needed both a string example and an integer example. And so I provided them working examples of that. Um, I had unintentionally, in, in the first version of the labs, instead of using integers, I'd used a Boolean. And if you know anything about Java, you know the naming conventions for Booleans are different. There is property rather than get property. Oh my God, were they confused. And to me, I'm like, we forget. Curse of expertise, we forget what we know because it's, it's automatic, right? We've chunked it so well and, and connected it and networked it so well on long-term memory, it's automatic. And once I, as soon as I saw one of the students have trouble with that, I was like, oh, I made that mistake. Because it had nothing, it was not an example of something they needed to work with. I was just, oh, let me show this other thing, right? That same mistake of like, no, it wasn't relevant. Even though an expert would have been, oh, okay, I get it, I'm fine. They were novices, and it confused them a lot. Um, so worked examples are great, but be very careful that the example supports what you're trying to teach them. So there's this then stage of where, okay, you've given them working examples, you've removed the scaffolding, and you then would do what's called fading. You give them less support, you let them do more on their own. So I mentioned watching out for prior knowledge. So this is an API from Mailgun. I don't hope I'm not picking too much on, on Mailgun here, but uh, this is a horrible example. <laughs> um, and I, I looked at this and like, I know how to use curl. And I'm still like, I have no idea what some of this is doing. So first of all, I can't just take it and run it because there's stuff that I'd have to replace here. My uh, username and my, my, some addresses, so I can't just take it and run it. And one of the things about examples, especially in, in our field, is we should be able to, as much as possible, like click a button and just get it to run to see what it, what it does. What if they don't know what curl is? For the longest time I was on Windows before I worked for Apple, I was a Windows guy. Now I, I'm sort of addicted. Um, maybe they don't know what curl is. Maybe they're used to using Postman. So don't show them one way of doing it. Show them the curl way and the Postman way and maybe the third way. Right? Yes, it's a little bit more work, but those Windows folks who, or those you know, QA folks who don't use curl, they will thank you for it. And what's dash dash user? I can guess what it is, but I've used, I don't know what that was. Dash app, I, I'd have to look that up. There's also two, two addresses. Why? This is the first example. That's extraneous, right? The core thing that, that they're trying to teach me here is here is the URL, here's the content that you need, and there's other stuff that's extraneous. And that confuses me because now I'm wondering, do I, do I need two twos? Is there something magical here? I don't know. And mime, what the hell is mime? I know what mime is. 
but does everyone? Is that important? Maybe it's important later, but for this first example, I don't know. And log entry, like there's just like, hey, let's do all the stuff, you know, like that. Um, there's this par, par, uh, um, tool or, or way of posing problems that are what are called Parsons problems. So when, instead of focusing on the syntax and, and having them type things, you create a thing where they just have to get the order right and they drag and drop it into the correct order. And so what's great about this is it allows them to focus on the ordering of the statements, which when you're learning a language is what's important rather than the syntax. And they also get immediate feedback. They can drag and drop it and hit check it. Oh, I got it right. Hmm. Drag and drop it, check it. Yeah, I got it right. And you give a number of those. And so here it's scaffolding of a, of a, different, of a different sort. Um, I do this all the time now, labeling of sub-goals. Don't have just like, here's 10 different steps, undifferentiated. Do this, 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 and you're done. Overloads cognitive memory, don't have any concept of, of what each section is, section it off, put in subheadings. So understanding who your audience is means you will avoid what's called the expertise reversal effect. Turns out stuff that works well for novices to support them actually impedes the performance of experts because they're either like, I know this. Uh, is there something I'm not seeing that I'm supposed to see? Um, I'm bored. Um, I'm not learning anything. I'm not motivated. The other thing is, please use hypermedia. We are in a web environment for 20 plus years. There's this thing called links. Don't have like big, long documents. I, I don't understand it. We have links to other pages. Like, for example, if you're giving instructions, are you on Windows? Click here, and then all the instructions would be for Windows. If you're, like, I remember as a Windows user and looking at Heroku, I, I am honestly can say the dollar sign prompt, I had no idea what it meant. I was a Windows user. And it had been like, a, and so even what the prompt was at a command line, I didn't know. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is here is, is uh, in addition to like, don't give me a whole bunch of instructions for, for setup. Like, take me to an instruction page that's detailed, that shows me how to validate it. Um, on my well-tested learning site, you can see examples of, of that. Like, run this command, see what the output is. If you don't get this, you need to go over here and figure out what's wrong. And, you know, then you can centralize that setup page into, into one place. Um, another thing is what's called a split attention effect. So this is where diagram over here with color-coded stuff and the definition of what those colors are over here. And you have to look here and then back here and then here and back here and that's just awful. Um, a great thing is there's a, the environment from uh, JetBrains, the IntelliJ idea editor. One of the things they realize is that when you're debugging, you, your attention is split. At the bottom, you've got the stuff you're focusing on, the variables that you want to monitor, and the code is at the top. So now I have to look at the code and look at the variables and then look at the code and then refine the variables. So my attention is split. So what they have is a feature that embeds that information into the code. So they've solved the split attention effect. So this is before, debugging only, code only. And then after, which is now the debugging info is directly next to and embedded in the code. Sorry. Sir? This is IntelliJ IDEA. Um, or any of the JetBrains products have, have this, but especially for Java, IntelliJ IDEA. The other thing is, is leverage dual coding. We have two ways of, of taking in information. As long as you are sighted, you can take in information through your eyes, and most of the high bandwidth information comes in through there. We also have information that comes in through our ears. And ha not having them work together, having them fight each other can be a problem. So you may have noticed when I had a slide that was mostly text, I didn't say anything. Because you're using your eyes, but you're processing verb, basically words. And if I were to talk over it, you'd either have to listen to me and ignore the text, or most likely you'd read the text and ignore what I was saying. So you can kind of visualize it like this. You get twice as much information using both pathways um, you would then, then with a single one. But they have to be related. If they're talking about different things, not, not helpful. So I'm running against time, and there are just a couple of topics left. Um, 
One thing that I use for battling the curse of expertise is what are called concept maps. And the idea of a concept map is you take, is, uh, so for example, this was for a lab I was trying to teach a REST template in, in Java Spring. And so it's like, okay, what do they, that's what I want them to know and learn. I trace back from there, what do they need to know in order to know that topic? Okay, they need to know REST, and they need to know this get object method, and they need to know what an entity is. Okay, for REST, what do they need to know about that? Well, they need to know HTTP. You basically track it back until you get to something fundamental that they either know or you can quickly teach. And so from there, it, it often, by really thinking about what is all the things you need to know about this specific aspect, you can then realize, oh, wow, they, I am assuming they know HTTP. Maybe they think they know it, and so I'll probe. And you know, people know some of the basics, but may not know some of the particulars. Um, this is a, a meta concept map because it's a concept map of, a, of what concept maps are. So you can go, Google, you can go Google for that. Um, I wish I made that up, but like, what, and one of the things this is really great if you're interviewing subject matter experts. Work with them on a, on a on a map. This is a great map. What I was this is kind of a cheap. I haven't put anything on the on the on the edges in terms of what explains what. Um, a real concept map has, you know, uh, basically the words, so concept maps represent organized knowledge which includes associated feelings, or et cetera. So it has labeled lines which is really important to show the relationships between the concepts. Um, what software am I using? Uh, so actually for this one, I love writing stuff in ASCII and having a tool create a diagram out of it. So I actually use a tool called Mermaid.js for this one. Um, plant UML uh, dot is also a way. So basically for me, anything that I can edit very easily without having to drag and drop, I hate graphic editing tools. So I want, so that's what I use. But you know, you can use those if you're, if you're good at it. Um, so I wanna finish off with a couple of learning myths. Uh, I'm gonna skip this one. You might have seen this, or this. They're lies, <laughs> lies. And you know they're lies because those percentages are too perfect, <laughs> among other things. These are lies. The, the, this National Training Laboratories doesn't really exist. It's bogus. It is not science at all. If anybody says, let's make sure we, we do this versus this because of, the, of this learning pyramid or what's called Dale's cone, lie. Complete and utter bunk. <laughs> Some of you may react strongly to this, but learning styles are not helpful. They may exist in the sense of we've taken and processed information differently but that shouldn't guide us or make us waste time on the materials that we're creating, right? I'm not going to dance and have us dance through learning Java, right? It makes no sense. Um, so the idea is that there's an effective mode that people take in information, but we're all pretty similar. Usually most of it's visual, some of it oral. Um, really what's important is prior knowledge and building on that and not overloading them, right? So you might have seen VARC or whatever, nope. No data. In fact, several times there have been huge, full volume publications of the educational psychology saying, here's its bunk and here's all the proof why it's bunk. Stop promulgating it. Stop saying this is something useful. Um, it's not. But I, I don't feel strongly about that. Yeah. Yep. There's lots of. Be, and you know, like, like a lot of myths is because it seems like, oh, that kind of makes sense. And it's not that there's nothing useful there. It's just, let's rely on stuff that we can actually make use of better. Let's, let's not waste time with that. And there's some still. Yeah. All right, so let's do some retrieval practice. <laughs> so what's learning? Well, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, one, one way you could think about it is what's accessible from long-term memory. What's nice about retrieval practice is you don't have to have the perfect example and be able to express it, 
but the idea that you're sort of reaching back and, and pulling that forward and maybe you're still confused about it, maybe it's not quite clear, but you've brought it back and it's like, oh, now I can look at it and, and think about it more. All right, so what are some ways to improve access to long-term memory? Testing. Testing. Yep. All right, so any form of retrieval practice. All right, so some examples are testing using spaced retrieval. Okay, so what do we need for correct learning? What's the important piece that we need? Well, that, that's useful, yeah, not extraneous stuff. Anybody say feedback? And when do we need feedback? Now. <laughs> now, we want it now. So in a timely fashion. What do we know about working memory? It's small, it's constrained, which leads us to, what is CLT? All right. So how do we make sure that we, we guide, that we don't distract the learner? Yeah, extraneous material, right? The other one was split attention, right? Don't distract them, don't make them look elsewhere. All right, so some ways of doing this are worked examples, Parsons problems, concrete examples. Have I said examples enough? And don't waste time on such learning myths as learning styles and Dale's cones. All right, thank you very much. And I'll take any questions if you want to hang around. Yep. You mean my audience is both an expert and a novice? Um, I, will, I will probe for prior knowledge. So what do they know? Um, so it depends if, if, I'm, if I'm creating materials that I, I'm not gonna be interacting with that learner, um, then I will create different sets of materials. I will create, um, I was actually talking to uh, this gentleman over here, and you basically give them a little quiz. See how, what they know, and if they're like, not getting any of it right, you direct them to the stuff that's oriented, that has, that has very well scaffolded, lots of worked examples, and slowly fade it versus they know some of this stuff and now you can start them off. The idea is you're gonna have to remediate some of that lack of knowledge and then you can shift them over to, to more expert. It's a little more work, but to, to do otherwise means you're either gonna confuse the novices uh, or bore the, 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 the experts. Yeah. The, the example you have with uh, the uh, and you follow an example where it was an example for an extra audience. So the additional stuff that you're, you're looking for may have been, I'm not, I'm not saying they're correct, but maybe they thought it was extreme. And so like, how do you, how you balance that? <coughs> you're, you're, you're always, you know, when it, with any kind of audience, you're always going to have some people who don't fit. I pointed out that one because my, the goal there was not to learn curl. The goal there was to use an API. And so you, so you want to, the curl was extraneous. You want to focus on how can I get them to use the API? I may have to use something like curl, right? That's sort of like, I have no choice, but I want to reduce that as much as possible. So, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I have a question. So if, if you have a tutorial, you, you are a little bit safer because you have the choice of making uh, two sets. But if you're in an environment like this one where you have a mixed audience and you don't know the audience, so then what are the techniques that you would use to actually gauge you know, whatever? Because sometimes you're in the classroom and you're like, oh my gosh, all that's what you're doing, all that's what you're doing. Yeah, so the, the, the fact that you have a wide range of, knowledge, of prior knowledge coming, coming here, I had to sort of aim, assuming you didn't have a lot, which meant I might bore some people. Um, in a class of any, anything more than one person, you're gonna bore some people and you're gonna completely confuse another set of people. The idea is you wanna hit, hit the bulk. And so I tend to lean towards um, have them having less knowledge. And if I see them catching on and, and I'll ask, I would, I, if I'm normally teaching, I ask a lot of questions. I didn't do so here because it would take too much time. But I ask a lot of questions like, who knows X, who knows Y? And if I see a lot of responses and I don't just let the loud ones talk, um, 
then, then, I'll, then that will help me, it's like, okay, and, I, and the way I design my materials is I can quickly skip over like some stuff, or I can dive deep into it if I, if I need to. So I ask, asking lots of questions is really important. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone.